spirit and take control. Wrap me in your loving arms and make me whole. Every situation that has troubled the mind unto you every bird seven realms of the Holy Spirit. One of the realms of the Holy Spirit is love. And that's why we see 1 John, Apostle John is talking about the levels. And he said that perfect love cast out fear. Because perfect love is a dimension where Satan cannot torment you. Listen to me. If you notice what Apostle John was sure to do was he revealed that fear is a tormentor. So it shows you that when your love is not perfect for God, that Satan will have different spaces where he'll be able to torment you. This is how you know if you're perfect in love. Because when you're perfect in the love of God, Satan can't torment you. That means that he cannot bring things into your mind to make you lose peace or lose joy or lose strength. And so it's very powerful how Apostle John, and, and he didn't even go into detail about this. I'm just explaining to you the revelation that Apostle John had. But he said that perfect love cast out fear. And he said where uh, fear has torment. You notice that fear has torment. And so the demon of fear has another spirit that it possesses called torment. That demon is underneath its control. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's an anointing already. So, so imagine this. Fear is an actual demon spirit, but it has torment. And so, so fear is a demon, but torment is its fruit. So when fear comes, it produces torments. But perfect love removes both fear and torment. Moves it out the way. So now you'll have perfect love, which is perfect trust, which is perfect peace, which is perfect father living inside of your heart. Be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Now you're having heaven inside of you. And that's the way that God created you. That realm of the Holy Ghost is called love. The word of God said in Romans chapter five, verse five, that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that been given to us. That's Romans chapter five, verse five. And so that love that we see poured out into your heart is the love that takes away disobedience, takes away sin. That love takes away any hindrance to move with God. It takes away your emotions from being in the demonic. Romans chapter five, verse five, when it said that the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. Notice it said that the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The, 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 the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. 
So watch this here. The Holy Spirit, which is the Lord himself, is pouring out perfect love. That's what he's doing so that you'll be free from anything that would torment you mentally, stress you out, make you insecure, make you fearful, make you tormented, bother your spirit. Imagine that he's pouring out love so that what wasn't supposed to be in you would go. And so the same way if you pouring juice into a cup, you notice the cup be still and receives it. You never had a cup respond to you and say, no, I don't want it. If you look at a cup, go pour juice into a cup. You never hear the cup respond to you and say, no, I'm okay. The same way you have to become a cup and receive the outpouring of God's love by the Holy Spirit 24-7. Even if you don't feel like you're tormented, you still have to be in the mode of receiving his love. Love is a realm of the Holy Ghost. That's number one. And that's what everyone has been called to do. Love, love the Lord God. Love your neighbor as yourself. But you can't love your neighbor as yourself until you yield to this realm of the Holy Spirit called love. Because the Holy Spirit is going to teach you how to love. If you are in a relationship with someone, you cannot be in that relationship until you learn how to love. Because love is going to show you how to respond to them. Love is going to teach you how to be cautious of what they need. You cannot work for a job unless you know what the boss requires of you. And so you have to be in love because love is going to pinpoint. If the boss is by you, the boss got four bags in his hands. Love is going to tell you, pick up three, pick up most of those bags so that the boss can walk. If, 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 if you're, you're, you're walking in love, when your child is hungry, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit say, feed your child. Because that's what love is, is, is operating, is being poured out into your heart. So now the Holy Spirit is saying, feed your child. If you're in love, you'll hear the Holy Spirit always telling you what deed you can produce that would bring someone out of being harmed, endangered, enslaved, um, or destroyed. Realm of the Holy Ghost called love. There's a realm of the Holy Ghost called wisdom. And the realm of the Holy Spirit called wisdom, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 talked about the spirit of wisdom. The realm of the Holy Spirit of wisdom, it, it is an anointing that interrupts what you were about to do. The anointing of wisdom is where God gives you a new perspective. The anointing of wisdom is where God changes the original route you were taking. Your knowledge comes into the proper alignment. That second realm, wisdom, is where God gets your knowledge into the proper alignment. So now, how you saw things before, you'll have a new uh, perspective, a new point of view. When wisdom comes, that's when your life will begin to achieve the provision that God wants you to have. The company that God wants you to have. The decisions that God wants you to make. And when wisdom come, you'll have strength. That's why Proverbs chapter 24 says that a wise man is strong. Proverbs chapter 24, 24 verse 4 and 5 says that a wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge, he increases strength. Because... The wise man is strong because the wise man has a mentality of the right perspective that has been downloaded to him from God. So now the Lord himself has given you that mentality. The Lord himself has given you that frame of thought. And that's why Proverbs chapter three says that happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Because when that man finds wisdom, now that man is able to to have the right thought life because wisdom changes the path that you was on mentally. Do you know that your path is not an outside thing? Your path is an inward thing. Your path is in your brain. 
If you want to know what path someone is on, look in their mind. The Bible said, as a man think, so is he. That's the path he's on. So the path is not something on the outside, it's something on the inside. Your path is mental. So if you want to know where your path is, it's in your mind. That's why the word of God was talking about meditating the law of the Lord day and night in Psalm 1-2. That's why Isaiah 26, 3. All these are dealing with the mind. Romans chapter 8, I believe, was talking about being spiritually minded. Because the mind of the spirit, it is a path. So when Jesus said narrow is the way, straight is the gate that leads to, to life, only a few that be that finds it, it is in the mind. The path to heaven is in the mind. Submission is in the mind. Love is in the mind. And number three is submission. But all these things are in the mind. Cast down imaginations is all in the mind. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was all in Jesus' mind. The Bible said that until the word of the Lord came to pass in the book of Psalms that Joseph, he, he waited on God. He submitted himself to God. That was all in his mind. The reason why Naomi was in the life of Ruth was to fashion her mind. Naomi had the instructions, the ideas to give to Ruth so that Ruth could step into a new season. That was all in her mind. Imagine Ruth's future was in Naomi's mind. I'm going to say this again. Imagine this. Ruth's future was in Naomi's mind. So imagine when God locks up your future in someone else's mind. Never believe that lie. You, you, you see it all over social media sometimes. People tell us, I don't need nobody but God. Use a doggone lie. Because God made it so that you'll need people on the earth. If you don't need nobody on the earth, you're going to stay broke. If you don't need nobody on the earth, you're going to stay without any provision. You're going to live a poor life, a sick life, a tormented life. Because you was created to love your neighbor as yourself. You're going to need somebody. There will always be a humbling factor where God will pit you in dependency of someone else. You will need them. Every wife must know that your husband needs you. Your husband needs you. That's why the person will marry you. They need you. So never look at your husband and say, oh, he, he doesn't. He, ne he never cleans up. He never moves it. D that's that's because <laughs> he needs you. Never look at your boss at the workplace and say, oh, they can't do nothing. And they, why they can't do this workplace if they're so smart? That's why they hired you. They need you. Don't look at your child and say, you need to change your own diapers. Your child needs you. The father pitched you to need someone. You come into this world needing someone. Go tell me when an infant comes out of that, that womb, how they learn to eat food. And how they learned how to walk. They needed someone. We all need somebody. The Holy Spirit will pit in your life who you need. For the woman at Zarephath, it was Elijah. For Gehazi, it was Elisha. He always pit somebody in your life that you need. For Samuel, it was Eli. Imagine this. He needed Eli. Because Eli knew to tell him, this the Lord talking to you. If Eli does not tell Samuel that the Lord is talking to him, Samuel will not be Samuel. Because there are many people today that are called to that type of walk of Samuel, but they'll never know it because they don't have an Eli in their life. The Lord will call them. They go ask somebody. I heard a voice call me. People will say, you're crazy. You don't lost your mind. And that's the Lord talking to them. People hear voices all the time. You got to ask them, what is the voice saying? We live in a spiritual world. You can hear the conversation of angels. You can hear the conversation of demons. And so, so many people don't have an Eli. And so 
he lied to them. <laughs> he tell them the falseness. Everybody share this broadcast. Invite your followers. So that number two, number one, we deal with wisdom. Oh, uh, uh, number one, we deal with love. Number two, the realm of the Holy Spirit is wisdom. You got to have wisdom. Wisdom will always change your path. It will change your perspective. It will change your point of view. Wisdom will change your behavior. Because when wisdom comes, that's why the Bible said that David behaved wisely. It affected his behavior. Then we have the realm of the Holy Spirit, number three, called submission. The realm of the Holy Spirit called submission is this. To always be ready to be taught. Submission is always be ready to be taught. And let me give you a revelation about submission why so many people, they need to hear this. Because submission is a realm where I position myself to learn. I have to learn what God wants. I have to learn what God will want. I have to even learn what God has wanted. So in submission, I find out was, is, and is to come about the Lord Jesus, about the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is the Holy Spirit. All right. Say that again. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Ghost. He's the spirit of truth. Me and you have a spirit. Our spirit is who we are. The same way the Holy Spirit is who Jesus is. He died. He said, I have to die. He was telling the disciples, I must do this. Because when you die, your spirit leaves your body. Jesus put it like that, that he died. And now his Holy Ghost came to whosoever would receive him. That's why they receive power in John chapter one, verse 12 to as many as receive him. He gave them power to become the sons of God. Why did they become the sons of God? Because his same spirit came inside of them, came upon them. They received the power just the same way. Acts one, eight talked about receiving power to be the witness. John one, 12 received power to become sons, becoming sons and witnesses are two different things. But when you become a son, you learn obedience. So it's a place of submission still. And when you become a witness, now you're teaching others to learn obedience. When we deal with sonship, you're learning obedience. That's Hebrews chapter five, verse eight. You learn obedience by the things you suffer. That's Hebrews chapter five, verse eight. And then Hebrews chapter five, verse nine, Jesus has become the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Now you're teaching other people to obey God. That's why you're a witness, because you're letting people know I have experienced this. Now you can. Number three is submission. When submission comes into your life, this is how you resist the devil. You cannot resist the devil without submission. Submission is going to show you how to resist the devil. If you don't have submission in your life, you'll become the devil's puppet and he'll swing you where he wants to do what he wants to destroy who he wants. And Satan will use you to mess up the will of God. If you don't have submission as a man or a woman, you will be used as a conduit. You will be used as a vessel to fight against God. That's the other side of submission. If you receive submission, you'll fight against the devil, meaning you'll resist him. You'll say no to him. If you reject submission, you'll fight against God. I'm going to say this one more time. If you receive submission, you'll fight against the devil. You'll resist him. If you refuse submission, you'll fight against God. You'll resist him. So submission is very important. It's the realm of the Holy Spirit. He teaches you submission. How, do the, how does the Holy Spirit master submission in you? He'll send an authority figure, a prophet, someone that will give you instructions. And that's how he, he masters your submission. 
You cannot submit yourself unto God until you learn what God is saying. God will speak to you. He'll speak to you through the word. He'll speak to you through authority. And sometimes the authority may not even be of God, but God is using them to test you or try you. That's why you must always be ready to submit yourself, because even sometimes when people are wrong and they're not of God, God will still tell you to submit to them. I went inside of a store the other day and everybody was walking this way to get in the line of dot, dot, dot. And, and I just happened to walk the similar area and I heard the guy yell out. He said, hey, go, go over here. But <laughs> the first thing. You felt I said nothing. I didn't tell the man, hey, I wasn't even going over there. I didn't tell the man, why you yell at me like that? I didn't say nothing because that's his store. And so. In that moment, you see there's a beautiful opportunity for submission. And that's what God get delight in. If you clap back at the man, watch what's going to happen. Now you become open to all these works of the flesh. Strife, hatred, anger, wrath. Not even anger, but wrath. Uh, all those other things. But you know that that's his store. So submission is peaceful. I'm going to say this one more time. In submission, you fight against the devil. You resist him. Outside of submission, you fight against God. You resist him. Submission is a realm of the Holy Spirit that you need. It's the third realm that I'm talking about. Because if you don't have submission, you're going to end up being an enemy to God and his will and his plan and his gospel. You're going to hate God's will. Saints, Haman hated God's will. Haman was not in submission. Submission, it protects you from hating God's will. When you're in submission, you're God's friend. When you're outside of submission, you're God's enemy. One day you can choose not to submit yourself. That will be the day that you gather everything that God doesn't want inside of you. You'll become a slave to it. Listen to me, people of God. The day that you don't choose submission, you'll become a gathering system, a headquarters for toxic devices, Toxic decision, toxic thoughts. The day that you don't submit yourself is the day that you'll welcome evil spirits. The same way I can welcome the Holy Spirit by having a heart of hunger and worship and praise and giving God thanks. The same way I can have a heart that is full of iniquity. You can welcome demons. You can welcome evil spirits. And that happens when you leave submission. When you're outside of submission, you're not powerful. You're underneath demonic power. When you're in submission, you're at your most powerful place. When you're outside of uh, a submission, Jesus showed us what happened. Remember what Jesus said, if it's your will, take this cup from me. You, you see the, the, the sweat turn into blood. You see all these things occurring. It's like it's so stressful. It's so hard. But then he said, not my will, your will be done. Here goes submission. The devil couldn't stop Jesus. He used submission. Submission happened in Abigail and Nabal. Scenario. Remember, David is asking for food. Him and his people are going through a hard time. They're asking Nabal to give them some food. Nabal refused to give them food. And so after Nabal gave them, refused to give them food. Remember, Nabal refuses to submit himself. Let's look at, now we see Abigail. She submits herself to David. So what's going on here? We're seeing submission. 
when we deal with we deal with Nabal, he refuses to submit. He becomes God's enemy. So God kills him in less than 10 days. See, when you're outside of submission, you become God's enemy. You cannot heed anything that he wants you to do in this life when you're outside of submission. So, saints, there's so many people saying, what is God saying to me? Submit yourself. That's the word of the Lord to you. You say, well, how do I submit myself? Number one, you cannot submit yourself without attentiveness. You have to learn how to attend to God. Because he's going to show you where to invest your submission. Remember the Holy Spirit guides you in all truth. He's going to guide you to where your submission must be spent. The currency for freedom is submission. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. If you take a notes, write that down. The currency for freedom is submission because if submission gives me the power to resist the devil, then the devil doesn't have power to enslave me. So the currency for freedom is submission. When you're outside of submission, you're not free. That's why you don't feel free. That's why you feel stressed out because you're not in submission. You even have to submit yourself concerning the affairs, concerning bills, concerning seasons. Sometimes you're in a season of adversity. You have to submit yourself in that adversity. While you're in a season of storms, you have to submit yourself in that season of storm. If you start complaining, you're not in submission. If you start wanting to shut down on God, you're not in submission. People that are not in submission are quitters. They quit very easily. They get discouraged very easily because they're not in submission. When you're in submission, you receive a supply of God's strength. When you're in submission, God keeps on boosting you up every single day to follow him. When you're in submission, God will keep on being your fortified place. Weakness cannot be the master of the submitted. I'm going to say that again. Weakness cannot be the master of the submitted. If you take a note, write that down. Weakness cannot be the master of the submitted. When you are submitted, weakness cannot be your master. It can't rule you. Because in submission, you have cut off the voice of Satan. Because remember, the only thing that goes against submission is the voice of the devil. So you have to choose either submission to God as a man or woman or become the devil's worker. You either are in submission to God or you work iniquity. You have to choose this day who you serve. The only way for you to get free from being a devil worker is through submission. So the next time you have an attitude, the next time you get irritated, the next time you get bothered, remember, am I being bothered because God is bothering me or am I being bothered because I'm not in submission? Am I being bothered because the Lord is fighting me or am I being bothered because I'm not in submission? When I submit myself, I'm no longer bothered because there's grace for me to attend to what God wants. There's grace for me to listen for the voice and heed the voice of the spirit. In submission is where your strength flows. Is a mentality that causes you to accomplish kingdom assignments. And when you're in submission, you start helping God's work go forth. How do you know when someone is in submission? They become a helper of the gospel. Submitted people want other people to receive Jesus. They want other people to hear good news, the good news of the gospel. When you're in submission, you become a promoter of God's power and God's word and God's gospel and God's messengers. You start becoming an advocate for this blood covenant. You want people to hear about it. When you're in submission, you're not a distraction. You never affect the anointing. You keep the anointing strong in a region, in a city, in an assignment, in a ministry. 
because that's what submission does. Oh, my gosh. How many of y'all understanding this? Submission is not a gender thing alone. It's for everybody. Everybody has to learn submission. Submission, a man of God has to submit himself to God to hear wisdom. A woman of God had to submit herself to God uh, and, 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 and for, for helping the wisdom go forth. God did not speak to, to, to Eve. He spoke to Adam. But he didn't speak to Eve so that Eve would have a reason to submit. Remember what I told you that submission requires a level of ignorance. Because if I know everything, I'm going to take on a spirit. If I know everything and if I know more, then I'm going to take on a spirit. If somebody is teaching you how to play basketball, if you already know how to play, their words are going to go out of your ear. You're going to have a spirit of dishonor within you towards them because you already know. So oftentimes the Holy Spirit will strategically pick a wise man for you to submit to so that while you're submitting yourself to them, you're also learning new realms of God, seven realms of the Holy Ghost. My God, I feel the anointing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now look at this here. We got number three, number four, the realm of the Holy Ghost called joy. The Bible said the kingdom of God is not uh, eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The New Testament gave us the revelation that is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy is a realm of the Holy Ghost and it strengthens you. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, it strengthens you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We also find out in Isaiah that your draw from the wells of salvation with joy. That's in the book of Isaiah. Jesus told them in the book of John, ask what you will that your joy may be full. So Jesus talked about a fullness of joy, which shows you that joy has dimensions. Joy has levels. And so joy will determine what level of strength you have mentally. Re always remember that power deals with your decisions, but strength deals with your mind. If someone is strong, it's a mentality. If they're powerful, it's an ability. All right. Ay, 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 ay. So, so now we see number four, joy. You, the joy of the Lord is going to keep you in a place of mental strength. That's why you'll be able to complete kingdom assignments because of joy. Joy will give you the stamina so that you don't quit, so that you don't miss. Joy will keep you focused. Joy will keep you enthusiastic. The minute that you lose your enthusiasm, you become a victim of deception. Enthusiasm protects your progress with the Holy Spirit. Enthusiasm, it protects your focus. Enthusiasm keeps you in true worship because you can step over into false worship. And false worship is where you withhold from God. What he asks you for. True worship is where you give to God what he asks you for. That realm of the Holy Ghost, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy is a realm in the Holy Ghost. Now, another realm in the Holy Ghost, number five, I want to deal with fruits. Fruits is exactly what it is described. A fruit is something that you eat and it's healthy for your body. The same way you are the body of Christ. And so your body needs fruits. The fruit that you do is not only a blessing to others, but it is a blessing to you. When you operate in fruits, you start getting servanthood minded. No, notice I didn't say servant minded. I said servanthood because a servant does not know what their master is doing. But servanthood is where you do the fruits of serving. It means that this is a 
a, a special activity, task, mission, sub mission. So now you're offering this fruit to God because there's three realms that are eating from the fruit. Number five, the fruit realm of the Holy Ghost. There's three different avenues that's eaten from the fruits that you bear. People, yourself, and God. There's three realms that's eating from the, the fifth realm, which is fruits. When you bear fruits, there are people that's able to partake of it. You partake of it. God partakes of it. It's a snack. It's a snack. You notice that we see that we see the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5. Verse 22 and on. But we see the Lord Jesus talk about that his meat is to do the will of the father. So we have meats, we have fruits, and we have milks or milk. We see that, I believe it was Peter that talked about the meat of the word. So we have the fruit, we have the meat, we have the milk. The milk is at the low place, it's elementary. The fruit and the meat are both a graduated place. That's why the Lord told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Because that's the realm of the Holy Ghost. Number six, the realm of the Holy Ghost I want to talk to you about is creative power. If you notice in Genesis, the Holy Spirit was over the waters and the Bible said, then God said, let there be light. It's creative power. The Holy Spirit does this through words. So the Holy Spirit will download the words in you for you to declare into your atmosphere. Ezekiel had to learn this realm of creative power. That's what God said. Can these bones live? Because every time God asks you a question, it is to activate you. God asks you a question for you to see what part of you is still not being used. God asked Cain, where's your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Because that realm of him was never used. He never kept his brother. So the sixth realm we're dealing with creative power. Creative power is where you decree a thing and it'll be established. Job 22, 28. You start speaking things into existence and it's the Holy Spirit having you do it. And when you enter into this realm of creative power, sometimes the Holy Spirit will have you speak things that are not even biblical. Because what he's saying to you is not something that has been spoken before. It's not something that you have heard before is, is, is a supernatural word. It's something that you're supposed to speak because God is doing a new thing. So if you look in the Bible to try to find the exact words that the Holy Spirit is telling you to speak, you'll miss miracles. Because this is not in the word like that. This is for God to produce something that is supposed to occur in your life. So remember that, and this is so powerful, that the Holy Spirit will give you decrees that are compatible for your destiny. Wow. Wow. 
the decrees is not for other people. It's for your destiny. And so you have to be very cautious who you share those decrees with or who you let in those decrees because if you share your decree with the wrong person, it will kill the intimacy you have with the Holy Spirit for a moment. And that can continue for the rest of your life if you never recover. That's really up to you. Because some people, want, once you involve other people, if they kill that, that, that word, that decree, now the intimacy with you and the Holy Spirit is broken because of them. But they were never supposed to be a part of that decree. Excitement can create blindness. If you take a note, write that down. That's a wisdom door. Excitement can cause recklessness. Inspiration can become expiration because inspiration often will, will, will make you feel so good that you don't realize what's bad that can take you out of what's good. You ever saw somebody playing on a playground? How many of y'all ever had children playing on a playground and then some other bad child try to come play with your child and just try to mess with your child? Have you ever had that happen before? Or like you might be at a doctor's office and your child is raised a certain way and then somebody call your child to get your child to do what they do and that's not how you raise your child and, and you become protective of your child. What's going on? Your child is enjoying their self. So now the devil is using another child while they're enjoying themselves to do something that Seems enjoyable, but it's not good. It's not a part of the protocol. The same way the devil looks at who is enjoying himself with God. And the devil will pit something in the, in the midst of you enjoying yourself. The devil will pit something there so that you won't stay in the boundary that God has for you to enjoy yourself from a pure place. The same way God sends people to bless you, Satan sends people to interrupt you. If anybody on this earth can interrupt you from God's will, they're more powerful than you. Jesus. I got I'm going to say this one more time. If anybody can interrupt you from doing God's will for your life, they're more powerful than you. But if you can complete your God-given assignment, that means that you're more powerful than them. That's the only thing that's going to weigh this out. In your lifetime, you say, well, my cousin, my cousin... They made me start smoking again. No, your cousin just more powerful than you. You say, well, they're not saved. I read the Bible. Exactly. That's how not powerful you are. Now you can switch that, but you're going to have to stop smoking the weed. Because if you say that they made you do it, that means that they're more powerful than you. But you have creative power is the sixth realm of the Holy Ghost that I'm talking about. And you can create a new season with your, ta with your own tongue. The mouth of the upright shall deliver them. You can be delivered by your own mouth. But you have to start speaking correctly. Jesus showed you that you can use your mouth to get yourself out of Satan's traps. Jesus showed you that you can use your mouth to get out of Satan's traps. 
He shows you that your mouth is a deliverance anointing. So you don't have to stay there. I also want to say this to you. That the more that you go deep into the Lord and you do things that the Lord wants. Satan will try to arouse bad habits in you. Be cautious of that. I'm just preparing you. When you make your decision that you want Jesus and you follow in the word and do all these things that God wants, Satan will attempt to birth bad habits in you. You ever was following God and then you feel like you're having an anxiety attack? That anxiety attack is a retaliation. Now, if you don't nip that anxiety in the butt, it's going to follow you. You say, well, prophet, how do I nip it in the butt? Creative power. Creative power will have you decree the right thing against that particular spirit that is opposing you. You have to learn how to talk in the same region of your assignment. If the Lord pitch you to clean tables and people are talking about you, now you're telling God, I want to get out of this place. That's the wrong words. Your words should be in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that I'm the best table cleaner since the history of the world. And I'm going to clean these tables with all power and glory. I have a strong anointing for cleaning tables. Ay, 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 ay. I'm anointed to clean tables. There's angels helping me clean tables. I receive fresh wisdom for which table to clean and how to clean it and, and where to scrub it and where to throw away things. I receive understanding. My behavior is excellent before God. While you're talking to yourself, the demons that's talking to yourself will be silent. See, you talk to yourself for the wrong reasons. You don't cuss people out in your mind. That's you talking to yourself. You cuss people out in your mind and give them a piece of your mind in your mind without saying a word because you was created to talk to you. But you never took the time to talk to you the right words. You supposed to talk to you the right words. You spoke to yourself about revenge. You spoke to yourself about an argument. You spoke to yourself about being in a vindictive realm. You spoke to yourself in a childish, petty debate, but you never spoke to yourself in the realm of the anointing. You never spoke to yourself in the realm of the glory. You never spoke to yourself in the realm of the fire of God, in the realm of favor, in the realm of excellence, in the realm of self-control, in the realm of submission, in the realm of joy, in the realm of peace, in the realm of wisdom, in the realm of endurance. You never spoke to yourself about finishing what you started. Do you know how many people don't finish what they started? They started in Missouri. They didn't finish in Missouri. Now they're all the way in Africa. They started in Africa. Now they're all the way in Missouri because they don't know how to finish. You pitch your hands to the plow. You pitch your, your concrete down and then you let the storm come and now you don't want to work on the house no more. You were supposed to keep on working on that house, not because it started storming, not because it started raining outside, you were supposed to complete that house. You got to talk yourself into finishing your assignment. That's the creative power. Creative power. This seventh realm of the Holy Spirit. Is sacrifice. God promises Abraham Isaac. He said off up your son. It's a realm of sacrifice. Lot had built his place. He, he was enjoying his place in Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels say you have to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Sacrifice.
Hey guy, Hagar, Hagar, Hagar. Hagar was underneath Sarah, Sarai, and she left, went into that wilderness. The angel of the Lord said, go back to Sarai and forget, submit yourself. The angel said, I know that you think that you're right. The angel said, this is the will of God. Go back and submit yourself to Hagar. What's going on here? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. The father sent Jesus. Sacrifice. That's why the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Sacrifice. Holy Ghost. Realm number seven is sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. John the Baptist didn't think that he was worthy to baptize Jesus, but he did it. It was a part of his sacrifice. He had to leave his tradition because his tradition spoke to him and said, you're a higher rank than me. How am I baptizing you? But he made a sacrifice to do it. Why did Elisha refuse the garments of Naaman? It was a sacrifice. Naaman said, I'll give you money. I'll give you things. And the prophet Elisha said, I don't want it. It was a sacrifice. The word of God declared that Daniel went on, went on this 21 day fast, didn't eat or drink. He didn't eat any bread, no wine. It was a sacrifice. The word said that even though Esther became queen, she goes on this three day fast. It was all a sacrifice. Ruth, every day she's faithfully working in this field. It doesn't matter if it's hot, if it's cold, if it's raining. Ruth keeps on working in this field as a sacrifice. She could be grieving that her husband died, but she chose the realm of the Holy Ghost called sacrifice. It's all sacrifice. Wow. Peter was a fisherman. And, and now this stranger comes to him and says, come and follow me. He leaves everything as a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. That, that little boy that had the five loaves, two fish, gave it to Jesus. That was a sacrifice. The Shunammite woman, she's feeding out of her own food. She's feeding Elisha every time he, he walks past. It's a sacrifice. Then she asks her husband, can we build on a place in our house just so that he can live here when he's ready and, and stay with how long he wants? Is a sacrifice. Elisha is moving with Elijah. He said, I'm going to Bethel. I'm going to here. I'm going to here. And Elisha said, wherever you go, I'll go with you. They had to walk on foot. Elisha chose the realm of sacrifice. Because the realm of sacrifice is where the double portion is. The realm of sacrifice is where God sanctifies you. The realm of sanct uh, sacrifice is where God trusts you. You receive God's trust when you make sacrifices that he's asking for. I'm not talking about the sacrifices that you make so that you, you think that you don't do what God already told you to do. I'm talking about sacrifices when the father is calling you away from something, somewhere, someone, Before you make a sacrifice, there's nothing the devil can do to stop you. It's in the realm of sacrifice. Father, I pray for every single person. Let them receive this message in Jesus' name. Father, as you spoke this word to me, I've spoken it to them. I've said exactly what you told me to say. I decree this word over, over this line. I decree the blood of the lamb over every single person. And I pray for their life. You want to receive Jesus, say, Father... Forgive me of my sins. I repent. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Some of you all need to say it. Some of y'all need to say it because you're in a dry place with God. Father, I repent of my sin. I want your will. Let your will be done in me. Say, Jesus, take me over. King Jesus, possess me. King Jesus, fill me up. Use my life for your glory. King Jesus, I give you all of me. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Start afresh with God. Start afresh out of the flesh and don't let the flesh come in.
King Jesus, take me over, possess me, hijack my body. Hijack my body and use it for your glory. The same way a terrorist can hijack a plane, the Holy Spirit can hijack your body and make you great and mighty. Jesus is on the throne here. Never leave you alone. In Jesus' mighty name. Follow me on Periscope, Prophet Joshua Holmes.